Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. Howdy and welcome to another episode of Indie Beacon Radio. I am your host, Beyond the Blonde. We have with us William Ledbetter. Welcome, William. Hi, Alan. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, we've actually been trying several times to connect, and so we finally got it, and hopefully we won't have any issues with tech or anything of that nature. It's working so far. Let's keep it up. <laughs> yeah. So you are an award-winning author, correct? Uh, yes, I guess that is technically true. Okay, so you hesitate on that. Why? <laughs> well, I, it's just it's just funny to hear it hear it said that way. But yeah, I won a Nebula Award in uh, for the in two thousand six for the two thousand sixteen season. So yeah, so I guess I'm an award winning uh, not a uh, writer. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the one you won the award for. Um, let's start with that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it and, and what made you write it? Uh, yeah, uh, the story was called um, The Long Fall Up, and it was published in uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, and it's a story that I've been batting around in my head for quite a while. Um, and it, it basically dealt with uh, humans having, um, uh, having children in zero gravity, because uh, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that that would be a really bad thing. Um, so in this story, there was a large space station or a space habitat um, uh, that basically controlled uh, humans um, getting into space because um, uh, they basically were the government of, of space and you had to do everything through them. And so if you were wanting to have children in space, uh, you had to have them on the space station because they had, uh, you know, they had spin gravity. Um, and it was against the law to try to have children out, outside of, uh, of the space station. So basically, at this point in our future, they had kind of a stranglehold on humans, um, you know, uh, I guess, colonizing the, the solar system. Um, and this was about a woman who decided that she was going to, to uh, uh, buck that system and, that, and about the, uh, the guy who was sent out basically to kill her uh, by the uh, owners of the space station. So. so they didn't want her to have the baby and thus why she's going to be killed. Right, right. Okay. So there's been a lot of studying by NASA done on that. Did you do a lot of research using their material or, or how? Yeah, I, I, uh, I did a lot of research. Um, and basically, it, uh, it, it, you're, it, it's, uh, it's not good. Um, you know, the idea that humans could reproduce in space might work if, if we're able to do it on a gravity, uh, in, in some kind of gravity, even as low as maybe a third of what we have, or even a sixth, like on the moon, of what we have here. But our bodies are uh, have evolved to use gravity as, as part of our uh, our uh, physiology, and um, so they've they've they haven't of course done human tests. You know that would be that would be horrible. Um, but they have done uh, a few tests with mice, and they've done um, a lot of analog type tests here on Earth. Um, and what they found is that it it causes serious genetic uh, mutations. Um, and in some cases, they think that it might even be a genetic, a genetic thing. It might even cause genetic mutations. So um, that would even be a whole new level of bad. So now I understand that you know in space they do research on cancer and all that stuff. So I'm sure that's part of that group of, uh, of research testing that they're doing and stuff, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. With the reality of us now starting to go out to Mars and stuff like that, are you seeing your story starting to become reality? Yeah, that's kind of always a risk with uh, uh, with science fiction writers. You know, it's like uh, staying ahead of that curve. You know, <laughs> and I like to write in the near future. You know, maybe fifty, sixty years out. So, um, so yeah, you know, I I, I try to. Uh, uh, I try to imagine what it's going to be like in just, you know, maybe 20 or 50 years. Um, um, 
So most of my fiction takes place uh, not not in the distant future, you know, two thousand years from now, but um, within a few decades. So that was done a few years ago. Your story was and stuff. Are you doing yeah. a um, sequel to it, or, or are you going to shoot off from it? I haven't um, I haven't uh, written a sequel to that. I've um, that was actually a, a short story. It was a it was a novelette length. And um, um, so I haven't written a sequel to that, but I've written a lot of short fiction. Um, like I think I have 70 ish stories and, and articles published um, and I have a novel out. So, and that's what I'm working on now is a sequel to the novel that I have out. So. Now the novel you're referring to is level five. Is that yes. correct? Okay, yes. so that seems to be not so much sci-fi, even though there is some aspects to it, um, but it seems more like it could be a reality type military slash sci-fi. How would you classify it? Well, I think um, I think Audible, who is you know Audible Originals, who is the publisher, they classified it as um, near future thriller. Um, but I think I think it can safely be categorized as science fiction. I mean, it has artificial intelligence and nanotechnology and anti-gravity uh, devices. So um, I think that pretty much puts it in the science fiction camp, even though it it takes place again, you know, in the very near future, um, and uh, and a lot of a lot of what is happening in the book would be very familiar to you know, to readers of of even not science fiction, so. Yeah, I mean, it is taking place in Afghanistan, and we have troops there currently and stuff, so I mean, there's that natural yes. connection right there. Um, and I, AI, artificial intelligence, is becoming more and more reality for a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. So you have that involved in, in there, and so it's not that far out from reality. That's right, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so where do you come up with these ideas? Oh, the ideas are always there. I mean, in a lot of cases, I mean, I'll, I'll have an idea and I'll write it down and, and then I'll not do anything with it for a long time or I'll get an idea or two and, I, and they'll kind of be bouncing around in my head and, and it's like, huh, this is interesting. I wonder, you know, if I can do something with that. And, and then at, at some point, um, things start gelling up. A story will start gelling up or a way to use some of these ideas in a story or a book that I'm working on. Um, and, you know, so, so it's, you know, it's funny. It's like, you know, sometimes you'll have a lot of writers will say, I don't know what to work on next. And, um, but it, that's never really a problem for me. I've got, you know, all these ideas and they're just kind of sitting waiting for me to have time to, to work on them. So I, I guess I kind of cue them up. <laughs> I can understand that because it drives me nuts when I get an idea and it's like I don't have the time to work on it. And right, it's, yeah. It happens often. Which brings me to the question, are you a news junkie? A news junkie. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty much. And I, I, read, um, I read a lot of uh, technical news and scientific, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I have a couple newsletters that I subscribe to that, uh, that kind of bring me, um, you know, space and, and science uh, news on a, on a daily or regular basis. Uh, and, um, and, and as those are, if you go to these news, uh, if you go to most news feeds, you know, like on Yahoo or Google or something like that, they have a section for science and technology. And, and I generally check there first <laughs> and see what's new in the world and see what's going on. Now with 70 stories published, um, you don't have a specific outlet, one outlet. You have multiple outlets for these stories. Is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. I've um, um, for the short fiction, I, I mostly target um, you know like the periodicals that uh, that publish science fiction because most of what I write is science fiction, and um, you know like like the long fall up was published in fantasy and science fiction, but I've I've had uh, stories published in Asimov's and Analog. Um, and, uh, but I also have a lot of stories published in, um, uh, in anthologies and, um, you know, which are kind of collections, you know, of, of, of short fiction. And, um, 
uh, like for example, even our writers group has has put out a couple anthologies of our uh, of our short fiction. And but I've also had stories in in some best of uh, you know years best uh, anthologies as well. So. Yeah, just so that our um, <laughs> listeners and, and watchers understand, um, for published novels, you have Level 5, which is the one that just came out. Um, Jim Dean Memorial Award for the first decade, is that correct? That's a, a, an anthology, is that what that is? Yeah, I, uh, I run a contest. Um, the contest is, is sponsored by uh, Bain Books and uh, the National Space uh, Society. Um, so they kind of co-sponsor the contest. And the contest is about humans colonizing and exploring space in the next 50 to 60 years. And I've been running this contest for about 17 years now. So that, that anthology that you mentioned is a collection of the best of the best of those stories that we've, um, we've had in the contest in, uh, during that period of time. So. And then there's also um, a Lone Star in the Sky, and then Tales from a Lone Star, a future classic, um, classic anthology. Now, um, being a Texan here, uh, you know, Lone Star is immediately I'm thinking Texas, but that's not the case, right? Well, in this case, yeah, in this case it is. Our uh, our writers group has uh, um, has put together a couple of anthologies, and and that's one of them. Um, so, and our writers group is local here uh, here in the Dallas area, so. So that just seems to be a good, a good uh, title for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they make it to the Lone Star Book Festival next year and yeah. have the books there. Um, we are just about out of time for this segment. Um, so we're gonna step away, let our sponsors do their thing, and we'll be right back. What started as a love letter to her son has become an international love letter for all parents to their children. Now you can read acclaimed author Shanna Lee Charbonneau's story to your children. When her son was very sick, she calmed him by singing her own song to him. She turned that song into the book, My Mama Loves Me, I'm Her Little Boy. She wrote three more magical books for all parents and kids six and under. Available at Indie Lector, Amazon, and all local and national outlets. poet Denise Bryson. I am the author of The Things That Cross My Mind, Love's Reality, both in book and audio form. I am also noted as one of the best poets of 2011. I have two new projects coming up. One is the Blinky series, where Blinky tells us all about our coins and our bills for our children. I also have a book coming out called Say Ye. It's quotes from Denise Bryson, just inspirational and that will help you along the way. Thank you for watching or listening to this show. Andy Lecter is proud to sponsor this programming. As a thank you for listening or watching, we would like to give you a 10% coupon code that you can use on our bookstore at IndieLector.store. Use coupon code VIDEO19. Again, that's IndieLector.store, coupon code VIDEO19 for a 10% discount on any purchase. Thank you. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us. Follow and his latest book, um, which is Level 5. Now, Level 5, um, as we mentioned previously, is available on audio. Is that the only way that book is available? It is. Um, uh, Audible Originals, they, they have a, um, uh, they publish original fiction now, and hence the name, Audible Originals. And they, they set it up like a regular pub, uh, publishing deal. You know, they, they give you an advance, uh, they pay royalties, um, they, they come up, you know, they find a narrator to narrate your, uh, your book, 
and they, uh, you know, the cover art and things like that is all provided. They do marketing um, since, you know, it's through Audible, which is, you know, which is a division of, of uh, Amazon. So it gets a lot of, um, it gets a lot of exposure. Um, and, and they pay really well, but they only buy the audio rights. Um, but the, the thing is, it, there's a six month exclusive period. So for six months after they publish it, uh, it can't come out in any other format. So uh, that, that has passed, that time period has passed for me. So my agent is looking for, uh, you know, a print publisher now to, uh, you know, so we can get the, you know, the print version and the ebook version of it out there. So, but it's done really well in just the audio format. So, so okay, now, you know, we deal with authors all over the place and stuff, and a lot of them are getting more and more into the audio. So what to you means it's doing well? Um, it's sold somewhere between 20 and 30,000 copies. Um, yes, that would be well. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's like, you know, of course, I get kind of a standard cut on, on you know, we, like I would with a regular book. Um, but the price for audio books is a lot higher. I mean, it's somewhere between like 25 and 30 bucks most of the time. Um, uh, but a lot of, a lot of people who are auto audible, um, uh, you know, audible subscribers, they just get credits every month for the money that they pay. And then they use those credits. So they don't really, you know, they're, I guess, you know, they can use that credit, uh, for a $30 book or, or a $10 book, you know, it depends on, on what they want to listen to. And, and, and audiobooks are the fastest growing segment of the publishing industry now. Um, I think last year they grew 23% uh, uh, compared to like, um, I don't remember what it, the percentage was, like 9% for print books or something like that. So, yeah. Um, print continues to decline while ebooks are kind of maintaining and audiobook is definitely picking up. So yeah. it's great to see that we have all these options and stuff. Um, yeah. We were at the Texas Library or Texas Book Festival this weekend, and so many people were saying, "Well, I listen to audio because I get, don't have time to read and stuff." So I fully understand yeah. that. Um, you have on there. Um, how many other books are actually on Audible? Um, how many of your books are on Audible? Oh, just the one. But uh, the sequel that I'm working on. Uh, they've already, you know, I've already signed a contract for this one. Um, so uh, that should be out sometime mid to the next late uh, 2020. Um, so uh, then I'll have two. <laughs> and it's a sequel to, it's a sequel to level five. So, um, and I've had a lot of people asking me if, if there was going to be a sequel. Because, um, I left so, a few things open. Okay. And what is the name of that, of the sequel? Well, we haven't ironed it out yet. A lot of people assume it's going to be level six, which <laughs> kind of the next next in the series. Um, but we, we're not positive yet. Um, that that's kind of the front runner at this point. So, okay. So, I, I without knowing about the book, and forgive me, I don't have time to sit there and listen to the audio. I I understand. Trust me. <laughs> From the aspect of what was going on in Afghanistan, trying to stop a nuclear bomb going off in the U.S., plus then the AI and Wall Street and stuff, what else can we expect in your new book? Um, well, the new book takes place 15 years after the end of the first book, and um, and it uh, the uh, the main protagonist is uh, uh, was the the daughter of the protagonist in the first book, so. For anybody who's familiar with it, it was Lee Gibson who was uh, the primary uh, protagonist in the first book, and her daughter Abby is the is the primary character in, in the second one. So, so it kind of picks up where the last one left off, only 15 years later, and a lot of things have changed, and it's kind of a new world uh, that's been left in the wake of, of of events that drove the first book. So, um, I've been really enjoying it. Well, that actually brings up a good question then, because you're sci-fi, so therefore you're thinking outside the box as far as how things look or feel or, or can be pictured. So you have this first book, Level 5, which is more of a almost current life situation, current you know, time period, and then you go in 15 years in advance. How much more creative could 
are you being with that time difference? Um, well, in, in, in some cases, the world has suffered a bit of a setback, um, kind of a kind of a soft apocalypse. So there are some things that slowed down with our, our uh, you know, with our forward rush of, of, of technology and, and development. But there are other things that that sped up. Um, you know, like in this in this future, they're they're partially into building one of these huge space habitats. Um, they've been working on it, you know, for 10 to 15 years, and they're still only about a third of the way done. So, uh, but it's 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 huge, and um, and of course electronics and and AIs and and uh, uh, nanotechnology has all uh, continued to advance because those are the things. Um, those are the things that were driving uh, the technology in, in the first book, and, and they and they're also uh, you know doing it in the second book. But they're a bit more advanced, obviously, than you know over that 15-year period. So. You get a how do I say this? Um, you get a thrill out of writing the future and the aspect of being able to create things that maybe other people don't think about or, or see happening. Is that oh, absolutely. Fair? Yeah. What is the craziest thing you've created in the future? And what are you <laughs> um, well, in one of my short stories uh, called uh, um, What I Am, uh, and it, it, it appeared in Asimov's last year, uh, Asimov's magazine, uh, basically a boy took his, his smart sweater, which had AI built into it. Um, and, and the sweater would, could sense your temperature and it would give you hugs and things like that. Well, he took this sweater and he converted it into a submarine uh, to go hunt for a ring that he had thrown in the lake, a ring that his mother had given him and he had got angry and he'd thrown the ring in the lake. And he converted this sweater into a submarine. It sounds really bizarre, and it was, but it worked. And a lot of people really enjoyed the story. So, Yeah, I agree. That does sound a little bizarre. You think of a sweater turned into a submarine. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to read it to fully get that. We are at a point where we need to take another break for our sponsors, but we'll be right back. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author of the book, You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents. That was a question I had to ask myself some 16 years ago, and you'll have to ask the same question. I had a father-in-law with dementia, a mother with Alzheimer's, and a dad with Parkinson, all at the same time. <laughs> everyone on the town council were thieves and murderers. That's what happened in Bandera, Texas in 1873. John Cruder was the marshal, yet he needed to operate outside the law in order to balance the scales of justice. He is the Midnight Marauder. You can find his books on Amazon.com and TopWesterns.com in paperback, digital, and audio. I'm Roy Clinton, and I hope you'll read the Midnight Marauder. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back to another episode, or the same episode of Indie Beacon Radio. And I am your host, Dion Bouzois. We have William Ledbetter with us. He's been a writer of over 70 stories, um, books, and, and short stories of sci-fi, realistic fiction, um, things of that nature. You have on your website a lot of information. Um, what is the most valuable thing on your website for people to come and check out? Um, well, I have kind of a bibliography that has a list of all of, uh, all of my things that have published, um, have been published, uh, and, and when, where you can find them. Uh, there's also a tab up at the top uh, that says free fiction. 
So a lot of the, uh, the stories that I've written have been on in online venues uh, that are still available. Um, uh, some of them are uh, some of them are even in audio format, and some of them are just free to read. Um, so if you want to you want to introduce yourself to some of my fiction, uh, that might be the best way to do it because it's it's free and it's easily it's easy to find. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and if you want to keep up with me on a regular basis, uh, I have a Facebook uh, account um, that I, I'm fairly active on, Twitter that I'm not quite as active on, but, uh, uh, but I do make sure to post any uh, updates uh, uh, about any of my writing and, and uh, publication, upcoming publications and things like that. Nature. And what are the, uh, are those Facebook and Twitter as well as your um, website, they're all your name, correct? William uh, yeah, well, the uh, Twitter, it's at Ledbetter underscore SF. So. SF uh, for science fiction, of course. Right. <laughs> right. But yeah, Twitter, uh, I mean, but Facebook is, um, is, is William Ledbetter, and, and then my website is WilliamLedbetter.com. So. Okay. And just to be clear on the spelling of the last name, it's L E D D E T T E R, correct? That's right. All right. We'll put it up on the screen when we edit. Um, as far as a word of advice for somebody who wants to get into writing sci-fi, what do you have for them? Um, well, for any writer, I have to say, don't give up. It's, it's a very painful and long process. It's very, sometimes it can be very, uh, very lonely and discouraging. So don't give up. But for science fiction in particular, um, don't be afraid. Uh, some of the best science fiction that has ever been published has very little actual science in it. So, um, you know, just make sure that, you know, the science is what your story is about so that, you know, it, it's not like a love story that could as easily be on Mars as it is, it could easily, as easily be in Kansas. I mean, you know, so just because you put it on Mars doesn't necessarily make it science fiction, though a lot of people would but <laughs> um, so anyway you don't be afraid uh, experiment play around um, uh, don't think that you're not smart enough to write science fiction I, I've heard that from people before and it's like you know like I said some of the best science fiction one that I mention all the time is uh, flowers for Algernon um, which is an awesome book and it won nebula and Hugo Awards and uh, there's almost no real science in it so and it was, it was written by an English professor, so. <laughs> That's interesting that you're saying that there's very little, if no science at all in the sci-fi, um, because everybody expects that. I mean, they, when they saw Star Trek and Star Wars and all those things, they really expected those things to be real in some degree and stuff, and yet most of that stuff hasn't been made yet or, or soon to be made. Um, That's true. That's true, yeah. So when you're thinking of these sci-fi items, um, is there a part of you that kind of hopes that they do make something or, or learn not to make that item because of what it might do? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of science fiction writers, I think that's kind of, um, I think that's kind of what they try to do is, it's like, look, if you're not careful, this bad thing could happen. Um, but I think that science and, and the tools created with science, they're, they're just that, they're tools. It, it depends on how you use them and, and what safeguards you put in place uh, to make sure that they can't be used you know, for bad things. Uh, but they're all just tools. They're you know, just like fire and a hammer. You, know, you can kill somebody with either of those, but they've been around since the beginning of humanity. So. Okay. Well, we're at the end of the show and I'm gonna real quickly mention again, your website is williamledbetter.com. Your Facebook is William Ledbetter, and then the Twitter ID is Ledbetter underscore SF, correct? Right. Well, I thank you very much for being with us, and we wish you the best of luck. Great, thanks. I'm glad we could finally connect <laughs> up right. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website at IndieBeacon.com.